Now that we've explored programming paradigms that involve mutability of data, let's turn our attention once again to the semantics of programming languages. We have already seen a form of semantics known as the substitution semantics, based on the idea that two expressions mean the same thing if we can substitute one for the other in any proposition and preserve truth. But this notion of semantics runs into some problems, especially when we consider using it for a language that involves mutability. With references, we can have situations where the exact same expressions evaluate to different values, something that our current substitution semantics can't easily handle. So instead, we'll use a different form of semantics, environment semantics, where we evaluate expressions using an environment, a mapping between variables and their values. For example, a mapping might map the variable x to the value 1 and y to the value 2, which we notate using curly braces and arrows to show which variables map to which values. We can use a symbol, like the letter E, to stand in for an environment. When we use notation like this, we're describing the environment we get when we take the environment E and augment it to map the variable x to the value v. So for example, if E were this environment, and we augmented it so that z maps to 3, then the result would be an environment where x maps to 1, y maps to 2, and z maps to 3. So now, let's examine how we can evaluate expressions in the environment semantics. When we were working in the substitution semantics, we wrote judgments of the form p evaluates to v, to mean that an expression p evaluates to a value v. Now, we'll instead define judgments of this form. In the environment e, the expression p evaluates to v. Using this format, we can write some of our evaluation rules. Here, for example, is our rule for integers. It says that if we have a number n, when we evaluate it in the environment e, we get that same number n. And that makes sense. If we're evaluating just a number, it doesn't matter what variables are mapped to what values, the number always evaluates to itself. Here's another rule, this time for adding two expressions together. If we're evaluating the expression p plus q in an environment e, then there are two sub-expressions we need to evaluate. We need to know what p evaluates to in the environment e, and we need to know what q evaluates to in the environment e. If we add the numbers we get from those two evaluations, the result is what this entire addition expression evaluates to. What about evaluating a variable itself? How would we evaluate an expression x in an environment e? Well, in order to evaluate the variable x, we need to look up the variable x in the environment and use that result as what x evaluates to. We'll use this notation to represent looking up x in the environment e. So this rule says that a variable x in an environment e evaluates to the result of looking up the variable in the environment. With the ability to look up variables in environments, let's take a look at let expressions where we let a variable equal some definition expression in some body expression. If we take the definition and evaluate it in the same environment E, we'll get some value VD. Now, when we were working in the substitution semantics, our next step was to take the body of the expression and substitute occurrences of the variable for the value VD. But now, in the environment semantics, we'll instead just take the existing environment E and augment it so that the variable x maps to the value vd. We'll evaluate the body of the expression in this new augmented environment. Now, if occurrences of the variable x appear in the body expression, when we try to evaluate them, we'll be able to look up x in the environment and get the appropriate value vd. The body of the let expression will then evaluate to some value vb, and that's the value of the let expression as a whole. Let's take a look at an example to show how we would actually use these rules to determine what an expression evaluates to. We can try to evaluate the expression let x equal 3 in x plus x in the empty environment. Since this is a let expression, we start by evaluating the definition expression 3 in the empty environment. It's a number, so it just evaluates to itself, 3. Now we want to evaluate the body of the expression but rather than evaluate it in just the empty environment, we instead want to evaluate the body of the let expression in the environment we get 
when we take the empty environment and augment it so that the variable x maps to 3. Now, when we evaluate the left side of the addition, we see that x in an environment where x maps to 3 evaluates to 3. In other words, we just look up the variable in the environment. And the same thing happens for the right side of the addition, so that this entire expression evaluates to the sum of 3 and 3, which is 6. We can use this kind of environment augmenting for working with functions, too. Just like in the substitution semantics, in the environment semantics, when we evaluate a function in a particular environment, the function evaluates to itself. It's already a value. But what happens when we try to apply a function? If we have an expression p applied to q, we can evaluate p in the environment e, and it should evaluate to a function. We can also take the argument q and evaluate that to some value vq. Now, what we'd like to do is evaluate the body of the function. But instead of evaluating the body of the function in the same environment, we first augment the environment so that the argument variable x now maps to the value vq. This means that when we evaluate any occurrence of the variable in the body of the function, we'll be able to look up the variable in the environment and get the appropriate value. We can take a look at another example derivation showing how we would evaluate function application in the environment semantics. We'd first evaluate the function expression. It's just a function, so it evaluates to itself. Then we evaluate the argument expression. It's the result of a multiplication, so we need to evaluate the left side, then evaluate the right side in order to get its value, which is 12. Now we can evaluate the body of the function, x plus x but we'll do so in a different environment, where we've taken the empty environment and augmented it to have x map to the value 12. This means that when we evaluate x plus x in this new environment, each time we try to evaluate x, we'll be able to look it up in the environment and get the value 12 for a sum of 24. So the environment semantics are an alternative to the substitution semantics. And so far, they appear to produce very similar results in terms of what expressions evaluate to. But it turns out that these two semantics don't actually agree on the values for all expressions. Take this expression, where we let x equal 1, let f be a function that maps y to x plus y, and then let x equal 2 in f applied to 3. What does this expression evaluate to? Well, in OCaml, variables are bound based on the lexical structure of the code. That is to say, the x in the body of this function refers to the outermost x in this case. And in the substitution semantics, that's true. The outermost binding of x would be the one that we would use to substitute the x in the body of the function, so that when the function is called, we use that outermost x value to lead us to the answer 4. But in the environment semantics, if we follow the rules, when we apply the function f, the environment has f mapping to a function, and has x mapping to 2, the innermost binding of x in this case. The result is that when we evaluate x plus y, we use the binding of x to 2, and that ends up giving us the answer 5 instead. These two different semantics have given us different answers for evaluating the same expression. So what's going on here in the environment semantics that got us this different result? Well, there are two relevant environments to look at. The first relevant environment is this one, the environment that we used when we first defined the function. We call this the lexical environment, the environment in force when the function is defined. The second relevant environment is this one. This is called the dynamic environment, and it's the environment that's in force when we apply a function. Between when we define a function and when we apply a function, the environment might change. So as a result, the lexical environment and the dynamic environment might be different. Using the environment semantics rules we've been presented with so far, we evaluate the body of a function using the environment where the function is applied, the dynamic environment. And as a result, we could say that these rules manifest a dynamic environment semantics. But that's not actually the way OCaml behaves. OCaml manifests a lexical environment semantics, where a variable in a function's body is bound based on the environment in force when the function is first defined. 
So let's try to modify our rules so that we get a lexical environment semantics instead of a dynamic environment semantics. In other words, we want the body of a function to be evaluated using the environment that was in force when the function was defined. But a function might be called later than when a function was defined, at which point the environment may have changed. So in order to successfully implement a lexical environment semantics, we need some way to keep track of the environment that was in force when the function was defined. To do that, when we evaluate a function, instead of just having it evaluate to the function itself, we'll package together a function along with the environment in force during its definition. This packaging together of a function and its lexical environment is what we call a closure. And in our new semantics, we'll have functions evaluate to a closure. That means our rule for functions looks like this. When we evaluate a function in an environment E, instead of just getting the function itself, we get a closure, which we'll notate this way to describe the packaging together of the environment E and the function. The reason we're doing this, keeping track of the lexical environment, is because we'll need it for function application. Say we're trying to evaluate some function application P applied to Q in some environment. This is the dynamic environment, the environment in force when we're applying the function, so we'll call it ED. When we evaluate the function expression, our new rules say that it will evaluate to a closure, a closure that includes the lexical environment EL and the function. Then we can evaluate the argument to the function. We're doing this in the environment ED, since that's the environment in force at that point in the program. But when we evaluate the body of the function, instead of evaluating the function's body in the dynamic environment, ED, like we did before, this time we'll evaluate it in the lexical environment, EL. This environment is the one that was packaged inside the closure, the one from back when we first defined the function. As a result, this rule is telling us that we're evaluating the body of a function in its lexical environment to get a new value VB and that new value is our answer. By modifying our semantic rules in this way, we've gotten a lexical environment semantics instead of a dynamic environment semantics. The move from dynamic to lexical environment semantics has other effects too. In particular, it has an effect on the rules for recursion. In dynamic environment semantics, recursion works without any additional rules. If we have some recursive function f, when we evaluate the recursive call to that function f, the dynamic environment will have f mapped to that same function, so we'll be able to call the function recursively. But in the lexical environment semantics, instead of using the dynamic environment, we use the lexical environment, the environment in force when the recursive function was defined. And in that environment, there is no mapping for the function f. So how do we think about evaluating a let rec expression using the lexical environment semantics? When we evaluate the definition in some environment E, the definition might be a function or might contain functions. Those functions will evaluate to closures, but those closures might recursively refer back to the name we're defining. And that means the environments captured in those closures need to have a mapping for the name we're defining. What that means is that if we're recursively defining a name x, we need to evaluate the definition in an environment that has x mapped to something. But what should x map to? We don't know what its definition is yet. The solution will involve mutability. To evaluate a let rec expression in an environment E, we first define a new environment E prime that takes E and adds a binding for x. Since we don't know what x should map to, we'll give it a mutable binding to some special value that we might call unassigned. This binding is mutable because once we know what x should be assigned to, we can update this binding so that x maps to its intended value. Then we can proceed with evaluating the definition d in this updated environment, and we'll get a value vd. This is the value that x should map to. Now that we know this, we can update the value stored for x in the environment E prime to be VD. And since closures inside the definition may have captured this binding in their own environments, those environments will contain the correct updated mapping for x. 
Finally, after doing all of that, we can evaluate the body of the LED expression in this modified environment. This is definitely more complex than the other rules we have for the lexical environment semantics, but it allows us to achieve the same semantics for recursion that we expect. There are other ways we could extend the environment semantics too. For example, what if we wanted to extend our semantics to allow for references and mutable storage? For that, it's not enough to just have an environment that maps variable names to values, we also need to have some notion of locations in computer's memory and values stored there. We can represent that idea using a store, some mapping from locations in memory to the values stored at those locations. Now, instead of just talking about evaluating a particular expression in a given environment, we'll instead evaluate an expression in a particular environment and with a given store. When we finish evaluating the expression, not only will we get a new value, but we'll also have a potentially updated store, since the store might change during the evaluation of the expression. For some expressions, the store won't change. For example, when evaluating numbers or when evaluating variables, the store before evaluating the expression and the store after evaluating the expression are the same. But some expressions may involve changes to the store. For example, when adding together two expressions, it's possible that the left half or the right half of the addition will contain expressions that change the store. So our semantic rules need to reflect that fact. When we evaluate the expression p, we evaluate it in some store s, but when it evaluates to a value, the store we get back might be the same or it might be different. So to account for the possible difference, we'll call the store that it evaluates to s prime. Then when we evaluate q, we'll evaluate it using the store s prime. That is to say, if we made changes to the store when evaluating the left side of the expression, we want those changes in force when we evaluate the right side of the expression. Evaluating the right side of the addition might change the store too, so we say it evaluates to a store s double prime. And the result of this whole addition is the result of adding together the two numbers and with the store s double prime as our final store. Other rules work similarly. Anytime we have an expression that involves evaluating sub-expressions, we need to be aware of the fact that the store might change in evaluating any of those sub-expressions. So we need to keep track of and use the store we get after evaluating those sub-expressions. Some rules will change the store directly. Our rule for references, for example, first involves taking the expression p and evaluating it to a value and a new store. But then, in order to create a reference to p, this expression will evaluate to l, where l is some new location in memory. And then we take the store and augment it so that the location l maps to the value vp. Updating a reference also involves changing the store. When we evaluate this update expression, we can evaluate p, and since we're updating memory at a particular location, p should evaluate to a location. We can also evaluate q to a value, making sure to do so using the store we got after evaluating p. Whatever q evaluates to, call it vq, that should be the new value stored in the location in memory. So this update expression will evaluate to unit, since it doesn't need to return any meaningful value, but will also update the store so that the location now maps to the value vq. Once we have locations in the store, we can look up those locations. To evaluate the dereferencing of an expression p, we can evaluate p to a value and a store, and then look up that location in the store. Whatever value is stored there is the value that this expression evaluates to. With these extensions to the environment semantics, we now have a set of rules that can capture recursion and mutable storage while still manifesting a lexically scoped semantics. These rules give us a formal, rigorous, precise way to think about the meanings of the programs we write.